Good Monday morning. Welcome to Begin in the Word. What does the Bible say about wives who have unbelieving husbands? Well, that's the subject of our text this morning from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Let's jump right in. The Bible says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. But this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. This is a text that can be misused and has been misused. And so it's careful that as we unpack this text, that we look at the grammatical context, the historical context, before we try to apply it to our own personal context. And when we do that, I trust that we'll, we'll take some of the wrong-headed views of this text that have been misapplied to great harm, and we come to understand the Bible in its simplicity. The Bible's going to say some things that we don't like sometimes. We have to accept that the Word of God is the authority, that it is final, that we in our own ignorance are in no position to look down upon the wisdom of God's word revealed through his spirit. But at the same time, we should never elevate our own traditions or our own personal opinions over what the word of God has to say. So again, let's look at the grammatical context, the historical context, before we apply it to our own personal context. First, let's look at the grammatical context. Now, if you were with us as we studied 1 Peter chapters 1 through 2, you knew that we called this letter the Epistle of Suffering and Brotherhood. And we'll see brotherhood as a theme as we continue to go, but we've already seen very clearly why suffering is a theme of this letter. Because Peter, back in chapter 2, sets up these relationships where it is very easy for one party to oppress or harm or persecute the other. He starts by talking about the government and how we are to be submissive to our government, even though in Peter's day, the government was very hostile towards Christians. He talks about slaves and their relationship to their masters, even when the masters were treating them unfairly, of course, slavery being an institution back in their day. And here he's going to talk about the relationship of wives to their husbands, and not just generically wives to their husbands, but wives to their unbelieving husbands. And that is a particularly complicated topic for Peter to address and to address without causing more controversy and potentially more harm than he is solving. And the reason that's the case is because of the historical context in which this was written. I want you to consider this quote from Plutarch, for instance, about women who take a different religion than their, their husbands. Here's what he says. It is becoming for a wife to worship and know only the gods that her husband believes in and to shut the front door tight upon all queer rituals and outlandish superstitions. In other words, women, wives in the first century were not permitted. It was frowned upon for them to take a religion other than that which their husband adhered to. It was unbecoming. In fact, they were to shut the door tight. They were, shouldn't even entertain the possibility of accepting a faith or religion different from that of their husbands. They were to submit to their husbands in that regard. And Christianity has subverted that dynamic. It's already toppled that because Christianity has come along and said, no, there is an authority figure in your life who overrules your husband, who is more important than your husband and your allegiance and loyalty to him supersedes in every scenario that of your husband. And that is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so Peter here is coming into these, this relationships dynamic where wives are viewed as being disobedient to their husbands because they won't accept the religion of their husbands. Christianity is a religion that's empowering women to be disobedient to their husbands. That's the impression that outsiders are having against the church. It's very different than how people see Christianity today. So it's important for us to keep the historical context in mind as we unpack this text. But the second element of the historical context of, of the time this was written, the evidence suggests that women were quicker to become Christians, in greater numbers at least, than men were. In fact, that breakdown of demographics still holds today. Studies show that women 
are more religious, uh, Christian women are more religious than their male Christian counterparts, even to this day. Take this quote from Celsus in the second century. He was an opponent of Christianity. He said this, by which words, acknowledging that such individuals are worthy of their God, they manifestly show that they desire and are able to gain over only the silly and the mean and the stupid with women and children, referring to Christians. Christians, they only go after the, the simple, the silly, and the women and the children. So women were seen as um, as, as particularly prone to adopt the, the faith of Christianity. And so you put all of this together, you have this scenario where you have wives who are now members of the Christian community. They're members of this new body of people whose allegiance, allegiance isn't to Rome or to the Greco-Roman gods or to the, the, po the political structure of their day. Their allegiance is to Jesus as Lord. And women are embracing this faith against the will of their husbands. And so that's the historical context. And we see that here. He says, he says, even if some do not obey the word, that means even if some are not believers in the gospel, they have not accepted the word of salvation as taught by the apostles and their early disciples and the early disciples of Jesus. So he says, wives, be subject to your own husbands, even if they don't obey the word. And the reason is, is that they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. So the whole purpose of this is not to just subvert the power structure of their day, or on the other hand, to just get along with the cultural norms where husbands dominated their wives. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to win souls for salvation. So there are four lessons that we can quickly take from this text that we'll draw up briefly. And then there are four obligations that Peter places upon women and wives in particular. First, the first lesson we've already alluded to, early Christianity disproportionately affected women. Did you notice in this text that Peter never addresses the situation where the husband is a believer and the wife and children are not? And you might say, well, perhaps he just didn't care. Perhaps women just went along with what their husband believed. And maybe that was true in some circumstances, but I think the most likely explanation is that was not that common of a scenario that they had to deal with. If it was a common scenario causing a lot of strife, then surely Peter would have addressed it. When he comes to, to men in verse 7, he gives them one verse before he moves on to his next subject. So the fact that he's addressing wives with unbelieving husbands tells us that Christianity disproportionately uh, attracted women into the fold. The second lesson that comes from this is that Christianity reversed the norms of what was considered beautiful. It was common in their day, as it is common in our day, for beauty to be defined by the external. Braiding of hair, he says, putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing you wear. Just, uh, just consider the shopping mall nearest you. How many stores have clothes and cosmetics that are designed to make you look beautiful? The beauty industry is a a billion, multi-billion dollar industry in our country. It's expensive because so many people want to look beautiful. And we send this message in particular to women and to young girls. If you don't believe me, just watch the ads on television. Women are photoshopped to look beautiful and gorgeous. And the world has always, as it has today, a standard that says beauty is determined by the external. And Christianity sought to reverse that dynamic. True beauty, according to the Bible, comes from the hidden person of the heart. You may have heard growing up as a child the st statement, true beauty is on the inside. And that's a true statement. And that's a statement we get from the teachings of Christianity. The Bible reversed the norms and said true beauty comes from within. In fact, it's not just beautiful or should it not, it should not just be beautiful to fellow believers. It is beautiful in God's own eyes. The third lesson is that there are women superheroes that it is good for Christian women today to look up to. Notice what he says here. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God, holy women, the saint S's, if I can say that. That's what the word saint means, just someone who is holy. So this is how the holy women in the past used to adorn themselves. They didn't care in their adornment about the external, but they cared about the heart. And Peter says, this, this is a good example. There are women superheroes that, that you can look up to and pattern your life after who have lived a life of inner beauty. And the fourth lesson is women should view themselves as members of this powerful legacy. He says, 
just as Sarah obeyed Abraham and, and did these things. We hear the song very often, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons said, Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. But did you ever consider the Bible also considers Mother Sarah? And when a woman says, you know what, I'm not going to be concerned with the external, but I'm going to be concerned with the inner person of the heart, that she is a daughter of Sarah, and you are her children, Peter says. So the fourth lesson is that women should view themselves as members of a powerful legacy. Now, quickly, before we wrap up, four obligations. There are four, there are four lessons we looked at. There are four obligations in this text. The first, wives are called to submit to their husbands. Now, this is not referring to abusive situations where violence is going on, but it is still enforced as it was taught in the Old Testament. And again, it is repeated in the New Testament that in a healthy functioning marriage, the wife submits to her husband. The second obligation is that women are called to be soul winners, that their husbands might be one. It is not sufficient to say that the work of the gospel belongs to men, that men are the ones who go out and carry the, the work of evangelism in this world. But women have a role of winning souls. And women here are called to be soul winners. Women here are called to be pure respectful and pure conduct, he says. It has become very normal to glorify women who act in a very impure way. And the same is true for men too. This, this one's both ways. But women are called to purity. It is a beautiful thing, not when a woman parades her body about and draws attention to herself through her impure acts and words. It is a glorious, beautiful thing when she conducts herself in a pure way. And the same, of course, is true for men. And lastly, women are obligated to be courageous. He says, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. There's a lot of scary things in this world. Sometimes those scary things can be men. And the brutality and ungodliness of their character. But God has said, the men in your life are not the final authority. He is. And your husband is not your ultimate love. Jesus is. And when you put your, your affections on what is above and you trust in the, the king of the universe, he says, do not fear anything that is frightening. Women are called to courage. Those are the four lessons. Those are the four obligations of this text. This is a text, like I said, that has been and can be misused. Let's understand, first of all, that this reversed so many norms of their day because Peter is empowering women to disobey their husbands by believing in Jesus. But he says, all the same, you live in this marriage subject to your husbands, seeking to win them over to the gospel, living in courage, not being afraid, being pure. Adorning yourself not with the external, but with the hidden person of the heart. Why? Because it's beautiful. It's very precious in the sight of God. Thanks for joining us today on Begin in the Word. It's my hope that just as you have begun today in the Word of God, you'll live out today in the Word of God.